What do you understand by the concept of guilt? Well, guilt, of course, involves the notion of moral self-disapproval. Guilt involves the judgment that one has done something morally wrong or bad in some way. And here there are several important distinctions which have to be made. There is a fundamental sense of guilt which would involve a very morally negative judgment, a negative moral judgment aimed at or directed at one's person. And I, a person might hold the idea, in fact many people do often quite tragically wrongly and mistakenly, but they hold the idea that they are, quote, basically sinful or basically bad. And religion, of course, does no end in harm, no end of harm in encouraging that kind of total self-condemnation. But that's only one kind of guilt. There can be much more localized kinds of guilt where a person may have done something wrong, may have acted against his standards, and he can feel guilty over a particular action or over a particular piece of behavior where he does morally condemn himself for taking that action, but it's not a total self-condemnation. He doesn't regard himself as worthless or as evil. It's a highly specific moral self-reproach aimed at particular actions which he's taken, of which he feels ashamed or self-reproachful. Now again, we have to distinguish guilt for the purposes of clarification from feelings which are simply feelings of regret. In other words, a person might take an action not through evasion or immorality or dishonesty or irresponsibility, but simply through some mistake, but which nonetheless led to unfortunate consequences. And he might feel very badly over this, but he would be wrong to hold it against himself morally if he knew that he acted in good faith, so to speak, by which I mean to say uh, without any knowledge of doing wrong, without any intention of doing wrong, and without irresponsibility, meaning he had thought over his action, he had reason to think it was an appropriate thing to do, only later something made him realize that he was wrong. Then it's a plain error of knowledge and he shouldn't feel morally guilty about it one way or the other. Now, with regard to the element of guilt, there's perhaps one other distinction that's worth making. And in a psychological context, I think very interesting and very much worth making, and it's this. On the one hand, you can have a person, let's say, who is independent, who arrives at his own moral standards, who doesn't simply uncritically accept the moral standards of his subculture or his parents or teachers or whoever. And this person might take certain actions which he considers or learns to consider as wrong or immoral. And in such case, his guilt would take the form of, I have acted in a way which is unworthy of me, or I have failed my own standards. And while such guilt can be painful, and the person should try to undo whatever wrong he has done, or otherwise correct his behavior so that he can be confident that he will not err in this way again, there is a much worse kind of guilt which is reserved principally for people who are not independent and whose moral values are acquired second hand, who feel guilty not because they have acted against independently arrived at standards, but instead feel guilty because they have infringed the moral rules or precepts or injunctions of the significant others. The church, the family, the teachers, the gang, the group, society, or what have you. And people who are of the second category, who are psychological dependents, who are not independent valuers, generally speaking, feel a much worse and much more painful kind of guilt 
the kind of guilt which more tends to be directed at their whole person rather than being highly localized and specific to one or two actions. They feel in effect or are more inclined to feel, I am worthless or I am fundamentally bad because I have infringed the moral rules or injunctions of my particular authorities. And there what worsens their whole problem is the fact that their whole context of moral self-appraisal is second-hand. And as I say, for them is reserved the much more painful and devastating kind of guilt than the earlier type I referred to. Yes. To what extent is one's past behavior relevant to one's present self-evaluation? Well, there are a number of issues involved here. Obviously, a person doesn't, in effect, wake up in the morning and evaluate himself from zero as though he had no past record. As I've written in one of my articles dealing with self-esteem, I said, in effect, that self-esteem is the reputation a man gets with himself, by which thought I wanted to communicate the fact that as we make choices and decisions throughout our life, as we think or fail to think in situations where thought is required, as we act according to our judgment or fail to in moments of decision, we acquire a certain sense of self, which is the cumulative product of the kind of choices and decisions we have made. And they, of course, do add up to our self-concept and also to our self-evaluation. Now, However, it can happen that a person can act wrong in a number of ways and reach a point in his life where he realizes that he's acted wrongly and intends to redirect his life from this time forward to act differently so that he is on the premise of making a radical break with his past mistakes and his past wrongdoings. From the time that he makes that decision, if he means it, then his self-evaluation begins to change because that decision and the commitment to pursue a new course of action also becomes part of his record once that commitment is made. And he and he alone internally is the best judge of to what extent he means it or is just paying lip service ritualistically to the idea, yes, I've been wrong, now of course I'm going to try to be better. Well, if it's all ritualistic, then the verbal commitment or the alleged termination doesn't mean anything, and his negative self-evaluation stands where it stood formerly. But if, on the other hand, this decision represents a real insight into the nature of his past errors and a real dedication to live a more rational and responsible life in the future, this change will be immediately manifest in the fact that he will begin to like himself more. Now, the whole problem is not solved there, obviously, because the building of a really healthy self-esteem requires time, requires the implementation of this new decision, requires that he take a long series of actions, that he make a long series of choices and decisions, which are now right, where formerly, in similar situations or contexts, they were wrong, so that he gradually builds up a new internal sense of himself. And here it's worth pointing out that what happens is not unlike what happens the way that we might be led to change our evaluation of another person. If we knew someone who had acted wrongly and immorally or irrationally, we'd seen him do so a number of times, what would happen? We would form a negative evaluation of that person. Then suppose that person one day says things which persuade us that he really now perceives the error of his past mistakes. He sees what he's done wrong, and he's concerned about it, and he now wants to do right. And if we believe in the sincerity of his statements, this immediately begins to affect, in a positive direction, our view of that person. It doesn't mean that we now really admire him or can accept that he now is what we may hope he will become a year hence, but our view of him already begins to undergo changes if we accept the sincerity of his statements. And then if we see that he is executing this new policy, if he is implementing it, if he is now functioning in a more rational and responsible and moral manner, what happens? 
our evaluation of him begins to ascend, and the negative former evaluation gradually gets extinguished. So that what happens if we're dealing with somebody else, and what happens in our relationship to ourselves is really very much the same in basic pattern or principle.